Joining us now is Nathan Reynolds. Penny, why don't you reintroduce Nathan to our audience for those who might have missed him the first time? Yes. So Nathan Reynolds is an author snatched from the flames. He was used as a sleeper assassin. As a young boy, Nathan's innocence and body were used as currency to purchase influence and power by his deep rooted Luciferian family members. And as we know, Reynolds is an Illuminati name. Nathan? Howdy. How are y'all? Good. Good Good to see you again. How have you been since the last time we talked? Living dangerously, David. How about you? Uh, How are you? (laughs) <laughs> every every time I get out of bed. <laughs> remember to wear body armor to deflect the bullets. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Or carry a shield. You know, I'm a big fan of bucklers. You know what buckler is? I'm serious. Hold on. So, obviously, he has babies and dogs, too. This oh, is a buckler, y'all. Oh, my God. This is a buckler. It's very helpful. I did not think When you teach people how to fight with these, you got to teach them how to use these, too. You know? It's just fundamentals to basic combat. I, I warfare. saw a woman that wore nice. tools, but they were being used for a different purpose. Yeah. Um, but we won't go into that. Anyways, no, don't be left without your shield, y'all. We're going to talk about how to shield yourselves from things like propaganda and the systemic dumbing down of society today. It's going to be an eventful show. That I'm excited great. to be here. So I would love to just turn it over to you, turn the floor over yeah. to you, and like you did last time. And I really mean it. I, we were so honored to have you back. Blow us away the way you did last time. You were just so much great information. Well, today I was hoping to be able to talk about a little bit more of the way out of this just absolute hurricane of destruction that we're all trapped in. And one of the most important tools that we can ever have is being able to comprehend and understand what it is that has taken place at the roots of this absolute tree of destructive, intelligent oversight that's controlling the very fabric of our minds. How, how did Disney capture our imaginations, right? This is like their whole ideological schism that they've infected the minds is capture the imagination. Well, a lot of that took place through the systemic dumbing down of our society. So there's an individual who has put forth an incredible preponderance of evidence and work who was a teacher for about 30 years in the New York area. His name was John Taylor Gatto. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is kind of rooted in, in a lot of his Uh, work of what he found and discovered and understanding what is the underground history of the American education system? Because we didn't get here overnight, y'all. And we're not going to be able to necessarily work ourselves out of it overnight either. But we have to learn how to learn. We have to learn how to think. We also, more importantly, have to learn how to communicate these dissident ideas, right? What y'all are talking about, these very dangerous topics that might actually awake a nation from their slumber. But that slumber was systemic and it was very scientific. And it was rooted in two predominant overarching themes that that took root and, and they really borrowed from from a religious side of things and a and a scientific side of things. So on one side of it, you kind of trace a lot of the origins to the, the founding of our of our nation's modern education system, because if you go back to roughly around the 1860s, right, if you go right before the Civil War, if you if you really looked at an overall terrain map of the human terrain map of the United States, what you would have found is that three fourths of every person in the United States had an autonomous way of making money adding value to society and being basically their own entrepreneurs. It was normal that we had a lot of small scale farms. We had a lot of, of people that were innovative and in, intuitive to the ways of nature and to the ways of man. So children weren't raised up to, to in this artificial extension of adolescence, which is what we have today in this in the scholastic system, this 15,000 hours of compulsory education that we're born into. But what you if you really go ahead and identify the human agents who were players in this, basically between the 1860s and the early 1900s, we had a system systemic change of taking America through a silent force of destruction. And so there's a guy who, okay, there's a few, uh, there's one major family who has a, a lot to play at this. Charles Darwin. People are very aware of this guy. Mm-hmm. He's a character that most people are, are forced into learning about and uh, idolizing as literally the gods of modern science. And however, his book, which became very famous, The Origin of Species, through the descent of man of the favored races, by the way. So the entire title of that book has been stripped and scrubbed down because Charles Dor- Darwin had this idea that there were 57 races and the lowest of which those races was the Irish. Anybody who's got a little bit of Irish, I hope you actually read his book because it'll incite you to no end. Okay, so he thought they were the lowest on the totem pole, which gave great credence to the Anglo-American kind of ideology that the, the favored races were truly like the blonde-haired Nordics and the blonde-haired British. And uh, and so what this did is they began to give them a scientific backing to this idea that there are certain people that have the right to rule over these useless eaters, over these people that are 
that are dumb and are inherently retarded, as in the technical definition of stupid, incapable of learning, imbeciles. And so they wanted a legal justification for that through a scientific method. And this is why social Darwinism was given such a credence. Charles Darwin family was literally one of the wealthiest families on the earth at the time. And they were able to utilize that wealth to spawn and put forth with power these ideological concepts of things like the Royal Society and through an engineering of dissidents through eugenics pro programs like Charles Ga um, Francis Galt, who was considered at the time the wisest or smartest man on the earth. He was a, a big proponent of this idea that we have to systemically eradicate the population who are these other breeds, these other half humans. Right. And this is no different than any types of other eugenic programs that have been carried out throughout history that you had to find a way to control the opposition. And the way that they did that was through a, a forced education program. So instead of having logic and grammar and rhetoric as being the foundations, what was called the trivium or the quadrivium, where there was a way of training up people through impartation from the atmosphere that they were raised in through discipline and through the environmental teachings like ethics programs of, of what you could encode into your children so that they could add value to the society as they came out of it. Instead, they realized like through a man named John Calvin, also they borrowed this religious side of this appeal that there was justified sinners, that basically people were either bored to be, that were born saved and they, no matter however much sin or any atrocities they committed could never change their place. And then everybody else about 19 to one was his ratio. One out of every 20 people he believed was born a justified sinner that no matter what they did, they had the right to rule and be a sovereign. And everybody else, the 19 of them, were basically useless eaters. And his proponents was to fill them with compulsory education and to dumb them down and fill their heads with garbage so that this one out of the 19 could rule over them. So they took these two concepts and they melded them together to create a, a religious justification for it and a scientific justification for compulsory education systems. So they stripped away humanity's ability to think and to reason, and they borrowed the Prussian education model system, which was very class-based model system. And the man... His name was Johann Vichta, and he was a Prussian philosopher, and he put forth these essays proposing to the king of Prussia because they were trying to figure out why they lost to Napoleon, who had a very undisciplined, untrained army, and why the Prussian, who was the, the best trained army in the world, more or less at the time, why did they lose? And he said it was because this demon of imagination. That these people had imagination and soldiers were making their own choices instead of just blindly following orders. And if they were ordered to go die, that they would do that. And instead, they were making these independent choices. And so he, his, his idea was that we train away all the imaginative and self-autonomous entrepreneurial ideas, self-preservation tactics that are innate unto people. And we instead use bells and rigorous class schedules and mundane information and, and just continual tests to drive that out of them. And that got paired with a lot of behaviorist psychology as it was given rise through people like Sigmund Freud and then all of the various people that, that brought out behaviorism, that we could train humans as if they're animals. And that we could condition them just like a dog. If you ring a bell enough and put a bowl of food in front of a dog, sooner or later you can take the bowl of food away and just ring the bell and the dog starts salivating on its own without it. And so right. they used this same method of behavioral conditioning on the human psyche and in, in here in the United States to take this model and implement it here so that we could have a trained group of humans who were subservient to the masters, to the controllers, and ultimately to the corporatocracy. In the 1860s, the United States of America was corporatized. It was turned into a corporate entity. And this changed the benefactors of the nation from being the people as a whole to the collectorate of corporate interests who were behind the financing of the, the intelligentsia. Well, that, that, and, and you're absolutely right. Now, the, the indoctrination continues to this very day, however. It's not education, it's indoctrination. Yeah. And this is because it's a religious ideology. And the, the way that that's most perpetuated perfectively, like as another nephew of Sigmund Freud, all these people come from the same bloodline. They're, they're basically children of incest in a really perverse and serious way. Yeah, but this is one of the best. Listen, y'all, you can change your entire life by reading a book. I know it takes discipline and I know it takes time and it's way easier to watch a black mirror and have somebody else do all the work for you. Yeah. But by you sitting down and physically holding on to a book, you're going to hold on to somebody's pertinent information. OK, this man right here is responsible for more of the systems of control 
that influence your every decision every day of your life than anybody else that lives. He is like the incarnation of Satan on the earth. He's literally called the father of lies, okay? By his own choosing, he totally identifies with this. And that's because the ideology that he brought forth was to take this method of manipulating the minds of people and to profiteer off of it. And so he put out this little book. It's not big, y'all. It's 168 pages. You could readily read it in an hour or two. And by doing so, it would equip you with an understanding to dismantle so many, to shield yourself from those fiery arrows that are being launched at you. Like every time you go to the store, like one of my favorite things to do is go to the store and try to explain to my children. I have a seven-year-old and I have a four-year-old and I have twin, twin newborns. Okay. And I try to articulate this to them as we walk through the store and I try to explain to them what a marketing psychologist's job is to get money out of your pocket and to put it into their corporate bank account. Yes. And how do they do that? Why is it that when you walk down the children's aisle, the colors are very unique, very specific, very targeted? Why is it when you walk in the camping aisle, they have a totally different hue to them? Why is it when you go into the automotive aisle versus the baking aisle? Every one of these things are encoded into humans on purpose by design by people called industrial psychologists. And where do these fields spawn from? They spawn from this man right here. This is his book called Propaganda, okay? And people all names. Edward Bernays. Yes, sir. Edward Bernays put forth his, I mean, modus operandi for all intents and purposes right here so that everybody is without excuse how to weaponize propaganda. Modern day use of the word is public relations, PR. Yeah. Okay. So his definition of propaganda, this is just absolutely brilliant. And when, when you start to identify this, it allows you to be able to detect incoming enemy fire, and then you can actually defend yourself from it. But here's, here was his prose that, that he put forth in here. Propaganda is the executive arm of the invisible government. Okay. This is when we try to describe who is the they. So often it, we talk about when we're, we're identifying characters of, of evil agents that are operating behind the scenes. We're trying to look at people who are hiding behind smoke and mirrors. And that's because they're using this, this subtle craftiness of language and rhetoric to shield and insulate themselves from the actual uh, gods of reason that might be trying to govern people's lives. And this is truly the invisible arm that's actually moving the masses in different directions to control their opinions on various topics. And it is his, this was his proponent of how you actually do this. Modern propaganda is a consistent, enduring effort to create or shape events to influence the relations of the public to an enterprise, idea, or group. And he was one of the hallmark characters who was key to the rise of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis Reich. Even in here, he calls him his imperial wizard. On page 53, he says, when an imperial wizard, sensing what is perhaps hunger for an ideal, offers a picture of a nation, all Nordic and nationalistic, the common man of the older American stock, feeling himself elbowed out of his rightful position, and prosperity by the newer immigrant stocks, grasps the picture which fits so neatly, neatly with his prejudices and makes it his own. He buys the sheet and pillowcase costume and bands with his fellows by the thousands into a huge group powerful enough to swing state elections and to throw a ponderous monkey wrench into a national convention. What he's talking about there, might, people might be thinking Adolf Hitler, the imperial wizard, is a, is the leader of the KKK. Right, right, right. right. And so he's he's talking about he's playing pose here, but he was the architect of Adolf Hitler's propaganda campaign. He also partnered with Walt Disney to teach youth how to slaughter and butcher humans. Yeah. Walt Disney used Donald Duck to train little children on how to kill and slaughter babies, adults, and they did this by capturing that imagination because they had been training their societies through this compulsory education system on how to obey commands, how to obey their authority, why you have to ask permission to step out of your class, step out of your class. Anytime you want to go pee, you got to ask permission. If you want to know the truth to a question, you're not allowed to ask why, but you're only allowed to ask something if we say you can. And if not, we're going to use the herd to get you back into compliance. So he utilized someone. So like Adolf Hitler gave, wrote this book, Mein Kampf, which was eradicated from the, the vast majority of the United States libraries because a third of the book was devoted to the praise and the, the uh, adoration of the United States of America for being such a key component towards his success in his rise to power. Henry Ford, he used to have a 10-foot 
effigy painting of Henry Ford over his office, Adolf Hitler did, because of how important he was that the Ford Foundation wasn't enabling him to be able to become who he was. The United States have been active participants in these eugenic movements right. for a great long period of time. But it's only through this invisible arm of the government that the history of these events has been expunged. But through systemic understanding of what it is that these agents of evil have actually done, it allows us to get freed from the mind shackles that have been put over us and grants us the opportunity to learn freely and be able to apply wisdom and knowledge and understanding so we can make good informed decisions and not be skewed by all of these agents of influence that are that are constantly belaboring to keep us back in line. Now, uh, you, you mentioned that the that today public relations is called or propaganda is called public relations. I submit to you that in addition to that, it's also called news mm. because the government is actually uh, controlling what news we receive and the major media companies, which are owned by what six corporations maximum um, are in bed with the government and they're just disseminating the government's information. Would you Yes, they're the propagandist question? arm of the United States of America. Additionally, the great grandson of uh, Sigmund Freud, or like I, I like to refer to him as Sigmund Fraud, um, owns a portion of Netflix. Yeah, you, you hit it right on the head there, David, though. This this idea of limiting access to information is the way that you can control and maintain a conspiracy of silence. Because if, if you if you have all the information available to you, if you actually could, you could make something that's very, very dangerous, which is an informed decision. Without the capacity of being able to see all of the pieces of relative information, you're never capable of actually making a rational decision because you lack the foundations that's required for you to be able to do so. But as you are able to dismantle this mind control that was worked so systemically against you, like, like the best thing you can do for your child, like the best thing that you can do for your children if you're trying to raise them up is allow them to experience serious, dangerous situations on a regular basis, like a varied amount of life experiences. My family, because we we wanted out of this system, y'all. We realized we were in this rat race that we could not get out of. My wife and I both had college degrees. We were both working in our careers, right? I was working in the field of psychology, and she was working as an RN, a residential nurse, in a uh, ICU step-down um, unit in, in Denver, Colorado, off Colvac Street. And she was miserable. Every single morning, she was wake up screaming, F my life. She didn't use the letter F. She used four letter excellent inversion of it. Every single day, I would wake up and my wife was screaming, cussing, spitting, depressed, angry, miserable. And we would get home and we were like ships passing in the night. We were just seeing each other on occasion and all we were doing was paying bills. All we were doing was money was coming in digitally. We never touched it. It was going out digitally. We never touched it either. And we were just drowning in this world of misery. And we felt like we were trapped. But we did everything that, you know, everyone told us to. You go ahead and work real hard in school and you're going to get a good GPA. She was the valedictorian, salutedictorian, all this stuff. She had all the, the, the she was the, the super queen of everything, right? And here we are, did everything that everyone told us to. She bought a house. Her parents like, you need to buy a house now. She bought a house, right? And we got $210,000 $200, in debt. And then we started out with college loans and debt. And you're like, well, what do we do now? Well, we keep being applying ourselves to this same rat race over and over again. And we realized that we were miserable. And as long as we stayed in this, we were going to die. We knew it. All we wanted was our time back. We wanted our time back. We were making more money than we ever were. And we were more poor than we ever had been. And we realized that the only way out of this was a complete reversing of everything that we ever did in that. And so ultimately, it took us, it didn't happen overnight. It took us years, but we systemically worked our way to getting out of that system to where we began to buy back more and more of our time. We reduced our expenditures down to as minimal as possible. And then we ultimately sold our house and bought an RV with the cash that we had. And we began to travel around to learn trades because I realized by going to the schooling system that I went to, I never learned life skills. Like I didn't actually know how to live and prosper as a man. Like I didn't actually know how to put food on my on my family's table, like actual food. I'm not talking about things you buy at the store. I'm talking about like food that comes out of the earth that you worked and labored and toiled over and so that you can eat it in satisfaction. And so instead of raising my children in that same system, I took my two-year-old at the time and we took her with us as we went and started living on people's farms, small farms, homesteads people, properties that they were trying to develop and all various ranges of it onto a small scale farm that was 10 acres at the time that was feeding hundreds of families. And he had a perennial 
regenerative agricultural approach that was totally unique. It was in Southern Florida. It was a place called 12 Seasons Farm uh, outside of uh, – in a place called Olga, Florida, Old Olga. What we called it, anyways. It was a beautiful little farm. You, you was right behind this little like piggly wiggly like, like store, and we were like, "What in the heck?" We are in this kind of ghettoish area. We're like, "What is going on?" We go around, and there's bamboo. There's forests of bamboo and orchards of all kinds of orange trees and papayas and mango trees, and beautiful fragrance aromas coming off, and vegetables growing up these rows and tomato greenhouses, and just this overwhelming sense of unique identity bursting forth from all of the people that were living there. And we were like, what is this? We'd driven into the Garden of Eden and it's in the middle of a, of a tiny back road in Florida. And my child got to walk out the door with me and her mother every morning as we went to labor on this farm. We worked, to, we basically worked to it live. We became migrant workers. We didn't know it at the time, but that's literally what we became. We traded our time and labor for skills and they fed us and they gave us electricity so we could hook up and a place to park. And we got a winter down in Florida and experience what it was to work by the sweat of our face so that my family could eat bread. And I got trained by, I didn't even know it at the time, one of the best farmers on the face of the earth on how to be a master tomato vine dresser. I got to learn horticulture and agriculture skills from somebody who had traveled all over the world and had degrees and people from all over the world would fly to hear him speak on how to raise crops. And here it was, I had an unlimited access to some of the wisest people on the earth because I lived next door to them. And I began to grow in this relationship. And my daughter, Naomi, as we began to travel, and my, later my daughter, Jubilee, they began to grow up in an area that was not safe. We're working around heavy equipment and machinery and farm equipment. Like, it is a dangerous lifestyle. But at the same time, like, there was super deadly venomous snakes at times, swimming with alligators. Like, it was incredible experience because we got to learn what it was like to live authentically. What do you got there, Nay? A juice box. Jubilee's drinking some, too. She's getting her first little juice box. Yeah. Is that good, Julie? Yeah, you know it's good. It's the best orange juice ever. Good job, Julie. She's getting her first juice box. Mm, she loves it. <laughs> She's like, mmm. Good. You getting all of it? It's like to trade our life. For the, the, for the food that we ate. And we got to eat this in satisfaction. And we got to learn how beautiful it is to be debt free. That we are no longer slaves to the lender. And it began to give us this freedom to think clearly. And to be able to study. Because we bought our time back. And, and because of that, my daughter Naomi has become well diversified in a set of skills to where she is capable of doing and making choices for herself like a 15-year-old or an 18-year-old. My 7-year-old is more capable at taking care of my children than many, many adults. I will trust my 7-year-old to take care of my children before almost any other adult that I've met because she knows how to basically understand things like what is food and what is not. Most humans don't even know what to put in their body and what not to. It's a very sad degenerative state of where people are. They don't even know where water comes from. They think it comes from a tap in their sink, not understanding yeah. that their neighbor's pee and poop and pharmaceutical poison, not recognizing that if you drink that stuff, it's going to kill you. Not all at once because that'd be too obvious, but it will definitely 100% kill you if you eat the way they tell you to and drink the way they tell you to and wear what they tell you to. It's going to ruin you. But if you instead turn to look and study, hey, how did people do this for thousands of years? How did people get successful in this life? Generally, they did that by getting their children out of school as fast as possible. Well, you're right. Now, you mentioned something uh, interesting. You said, you know, that people don't. Um, well, first of all, children in school are not taught how to think. They're taught what to think. They are not allowed to question. You said anything from, you know, going to the bathroom to not being able to ask questions unless uh, uh, they're told to raise their hand or something. And then even those questions are limited. Well, that turns out an adult who is not going to question the propaganda being put forth by uh, marketing companies, a big, uh, uh, you know, uh, corporations and the government they're just going to say well if the government says so such as with COVID and everything else oh i gotta wear that mask i mean it's, ah, it's just the way it is i gotta lock down gotta be six feet apart you know be because they they don't know how to speak up and question because they're taught early on they're being indoctrinated in school not to talk back not to question things and not to think for themselves so you, you're you, i think you nailed that right on the head 
So then, so then the question becomes, so how, how do you wake them from their slumber? Well, I would say get them out of school. You got to do it yourself, right. either through homeschooling or, or, or you have to vet in some cases, because not everybody can do what you did get, you know, get an right. RV and go on the road, but you can vet. There are some very, very good if you vet them private schools, but for the most part, either that or homeschool, get them out of the yeah. public school system, no matter what. And, and honestly, what I, when I consistently ask people, like one of my favorite things to do is ask people piercing questions because you can really identify why is it that you are where you are today? Like Penny, you and David are definitely abnormal compared to most humans that are, that are on the earth when it comes to being able to, to think and process and, and absorb this information and then be able to share it out with others. So what is it that got you there? And by and far, what I find out for people is that it generally took a near death experience. Like by and far that there's generally something that rattled their cages so violently that they may have been going along for a long time in this kind of systemic slumber throughout their life until there's, I, I used to call it a hook in the jaw moment where you're swimming along and suddenly something grabs a hold of you so hard that it rips your neck backwards and you're suddenly catapulted through a veil of secrecy that you didn't realize was out there. And like it shakes you so systemically and it shifts your paradigm out of the normal to where you can never look at that system again because you understand that all the world's a stage and everyone's just a player in it. And you start to look that you're like, everyone's dancing around like marionettes out here. And there's somebody with a hidden hand who's making this whole world dance. And it's definitely not in our better interest. They don't have our right interests at heart. So who is it that's governing the society of the world? Who is it that set up the world in their image? Is it the one who created us with love and with truth and with wisdom and with perfection? Or is it somebody else who has an ulterior motive that's trying to drive people into a system of thinking, into a system of slavery, as opposed to a system of self-sovereignty? Because we're not supposed to be seeking to be sovereigns over each other. Like the original design that our father and our creator had for us is that none of us would rule each other. That he alone would be the governor of our world. That he alone would be the king over us. But otherwise, no man would be a king over us. That instead, we could sit at a round table and have a discussion where equal weights and measures, where value was given to people based off of life, not based off of power and prestige and classes. But the Anglo-American establishment, which is, I mean, talk about some incredible revelations that start to come to you as you realize that the British society began to devour the Americas in that systemic wave of that invisible arm in the 1860s. They began to inject these ideas into the minds of Americans that we needed to reintroduce the class system, that we couldn't have people over here that thinking the king's son and the street sweeper's son are just as capable of, of human beings, that we needed to re-engineer that ideology so that they could win the war against America, that United States and Britain could be allies again. Meanwhile, the same individuals that we used to wage wars against them are still waging the same economic war, that are waging the same military they were They went from a military war to an economic and cultural war. Yes, yes. And they were far more effective at doing that, right? Because they could not resist. The physical geography of our country makes it incredibly ideal to be a defensive territory. It's an incredibly difficult nation to conquer physically. We have massive oceans on either side, on all sides of us, apart from one. And we have a huge land mass, which makes us very capable of defending it. If you have a strong Navy, a strong Air Force, it becomes an incredibly hard nut to crack. And the British, which had the strongest Navy in the world for hundreds of years, could not crack this egg. As hard as they tried, they tried and they realized that this thing was an impregnable beast through militant power because there could be a literal sniper behind every bush. It was an incredibly frustrating thing. You used to have farmers who used to train their children at very young ages to be competent and capable with every version of a firearm that existed so they could provide livelihoods for their families. And when you do something like that and somebody has to hunt to sustain themselves on a regular basis, they become incredibly dangerous individual to have to contend against. This is why if you go over to Vietnam and you go back into the 1960s and 70s, you would try to understand why we were getting decimated by these people who seemingly were farmers and gardeners over there. That's because the vast majority of humans on this earth survive through the work of their hands. And when you strip that away through this ideological destruction of a society and you start to introduce 
foundations, these nonprofit foundations, the, the Ford Foundation, the Rockefellers, like you start to see the Carnegie Foundation, you start to see yeah. these agencies who are using through like the road society, who are using these roundtable discussion groups and these secret societies to start to transform the agendas and the ideologies of mankind to become benefactors of only a select group to maintain power and control over the rest of everyone else through these hidden hands of agendas at work. Well, and, and, and it's, it's you're spot on about all of this. This is it, it's 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 revelatory. You talk about uh, certain people, uh, you know, like Penny and myself and yourself, obviously, uh, who have what what you call that that hook in the mouth moment. I think every generation um, always has a, a a faction of it that has that hook in the mouth moment. Not the entire generation, but you know, a um, uh, like in the early twenties, it was probably when the when the Federal Reserve was created, mm -hmm. the income tax was created, um, and then in the, after the uh, stock market crash in the Great Depression of nineteen twenty nine, some people were probably woken up to this whole idea of the shadow governments, the deep state, and what they were doing. For others, it was the Kennedy assassination in nineteen sixty three. For others, it was nine eleven. For yeah. some of us, it's but there's always going to be a group of people that it takes some event for them to say, wait a minute, this is bullshit, you know, and, and, yeah. and we're not going to buy hook, line and sinker, if we give the fishing term again, what the government is saying. But again, we it's not everybody that wakes up to that. There's only a certain faction of people that do. Absolutely. And I, and I think those are the ones who have the responsibility to go and eager, equip themselves with the information that's necessary to be able to articulate it to others in a way that makes sense. If we can't communicate our ideas to somebody who's got the reasoning of a five-year-old or somebody who's got the reasoning of a 65-year-old, we are continually to cause this wedge of disparity between us and them, those who have the, the academic People who know how to talk in academies, right, are limited by that language because they can only talk to their little peer group. The, the people who write these scientific journals, you can't get published in them unless you know how to talk in our language, right? I went in, in my course of, of studies at University of Colorado at Boulder. We took research and statistics, and we literally were taught this is how you have to talk in this language group in order to get your studies published. If you want to be published, this is how you have to talk. Well, this is a control of language, Right. This is literally the same thing like Brave New World. It, like they, they put forth these ideas to show you, hey, they're going to basically control every facet of how you talk. And by controlling and limiting the languages, what we're doing is we're creating classes of systems, continually isolating people from the information as a whole. But when you have people that break out of whatever version of the class that you and some of you are in that academic world, some of you are in the uh, blue collar world, right? When you guys can build a bridge back to being able to communicate with each other again and understand it's not us versus them, that we are humans together. We're people. We're mankind. And that we have an agenda to persevere, to overcome, and to cast off these absolute bindings that have been constraining us for so long. And the way that we do that is to contend consistently with this system of evil through those same mechanisms that they have. Because this is a much more effective weapon than any of these other tools. As much as I absolutely love edged weapons, I love them. I love them so much. And from my youth, I've been well acquainted and well equipped and trained with how to use these to fight battles, to fight human beings. However, it's a lot harder to do that on a large scale. This is why people began to invent different types of warfare. This is why Tetranico, this is why TNT was invented. This is why so many of the, the weapons of warfare have been developed over time is because you wanted to find ways to kill more people faster and from a further distance away so that you didn't need as many of the useless eaters in between you and the governing bosses to be able to do it. This is what took place. World War I was the first time where we ever had this version of mechanized warfare where it no longer was basically guys with horses fighting guys with horses, where it suddenly took on this world of aircraft and blimps and massive amounts of tanks and battles fighting with vehicles. It had never been fought like that before. And so as we've seen that evolution of time for the last 100 and 125 years since that war to what we're seeing out now, which is this war in Ukraine, these proxy wars where the United States and the Soviets and the Russians and the Chinese and whatever other agents of evil ever wants to pit against each other are all fighting these wars together. And they're just 
literally using up old stockpiles of ammunition and funds before we can test everything out to see how we're going to fight the next real war. And it's very similar to what we saw in Laos and Vietnam. It's, it's a similar war that we see, these proxy wars, that your generation is much more familiar with, David, but ours is not. You know, there's a lot of younger generations that are ignorant to these ideas, and so instead they get bought into those propaganda systems. But by exposing people to authentic human experiences at a young age and being able to teach them to be communicative with each other, we can rebuild those bridges and we can instead implant in others the idea of autonomy, that you can be self-sovereign. You don't you can make your own choice. And for me, I believe the most powerful person on the earth is the man and women who's willing to submit to the supremacy of the leader, the truth. That is, I believe, Yahuwah Elohim Sevos, or the Lord of hosts, as I used to know him. I have tested it out and found his word to be the source of truth in my life. His scriptures were the place that I turned to to try to rebuild the foundation of because I'd realized so much of my life had been destabilized that I needed a source for truth. So I went back to that and began to examine this historical text to see whether it was valid and to be trustworthy. And then I began to, to live my life in such a manner, as he said, and I found blessings in life came from that. And I found that wisdom came from these ideas. And I realized that the same agents of evil that are described in the scriptures are the same spiritual and physical agents that I'm battling today. Yeah. And that this isn't nothing is new under the sun. And it says in Revelation at the very end of all of this, that there's these merchants who have been the ones who are governing the kingdoms, right? These ones who have been giving their power and their control to the kings through money. The kings want to stay in power. So the merchants, the corporations, as we call them today, the corporations give them the money to support them through the campaigns and the lobbyists and all these other systems to be able to control the people through their systems of propaganda, like you said, the news agencies, the media, the education systems, the militaries, the pharmaceutical industries. This is how they've created this diversified network to hold the things together. But as you cut the cords of their systemic control and you loose this another person, you really do set a captive free. And one of you truly can set a thousand people free. With these microphones, you can reach hundreds of thousands and millions of people overnight. And it's so much more effective to be able to use these weapons against them while we still can. You know, you um, you were mentioning about wars, and of course, World War One. You're right; was the first war that actually used the industrial revolution to fight the war with tanks and um, and aircraft. It was supposed to be the war that ended all wars. Of course, we knew better better than that. That's what yeah. they called it. My fear is that the next war, I mean, the the real big one that, that's going to threaten the entire planet, is not going to be what we're seeing now at all. It's going to be a, a war fought with artificial intelligence. Um, similar to it, there's an episode of the original Star Trek series in which uh, the Enterprise lands on a planet and they find out that their ship, when it landed, when it crossed a certain airspace, was destroyed in this fictionalized war that was conducted by computers from one planet to another. And what happens is uh, a, a, a certain city is allegedly destroyed through a computer war and all of the people who have allegedly died in that city voluntarily go into a disintegration chamber and die so that no infrastructure on the planet is destroyed. It, they, they just get the, the AI makes all the calls of how many people died in this city, how many people got died, killed in this. And that's what I think is going to happen. We're going to have artificial soldiers fighting the wars for us, and they're just going to say, oh, guess what? The city of New York has just been hit. Nobody's going to be dead. The city of New York will still be standing. All the people, But the, all the residents of New York are now going to have to walk into some sort of a disintegration chamber and volunteer, or 20,000, 30,000, 100,000, a million, walk into a chamber and disintegrate themselves because their city has allegedly been destroyed by this AI war. That's what I think is going to happen next. I think what what you're getting at too is just the overarching danger that that involves using uh, utilizing artificial intelligence as a form of warfare. But this is you you got to understand like Stanford Institute uh, Research Institute was one of the pioneers of the artificial intelligence lab. They were putting out robot vehicles back in the 1960s that were driving around in like. We, we have this idea that this is like a modern thing, that this is something that came about no, recently. What we're, what we're using, even the tools we're using now, the United States military had 40 years ago. 
Okay, we're we're yeah. we're eating oh, yeah. we're eating their waste piles. Yes. That's, yes. that's how it works. Predominantly, the Navy, the United States Navy, right. is, the, is the pioneer of the majority of this. So the artificial intelligence is that we're used. If you go back to World War II, they had artificially intelligence systems being used. Like they had laser, they had weapons being driven by computers and and munitions, precision munitions being launched by the Nazis in World War II. And it's it's hard for us to get our minds around this. But if you actually go ahead and study what were the cutting edge technologies being brought forth even back in World War II, let alone into the 1940s and 50s and 60s, well, then it all turns classified, right? And you're not allowed to know that type of information. Oh, we might trickle some of it out, but it's going to be redacted. But this use of, of artificial intelligence, of, of war gaming strategies, this was the original design for what are we going to use these computers to do? Well, you want something that's called a battlefield commander. That's ultimately the big desire and driving force behind artificial intelligence was that you wanted a battlefield commander that was not that was that wasn't so weak, weakened by by a need for sleep, for food and with emotional thoughts at all. You wanted somebody that could be able to manage all of the complexities of battlefield situations from the supplies to the individual platoon and single soldier at size element to the drones. If you think about the complexity of the modern battlefield, it's very, very complex. And yet we have more information streaming in than ever before between micro UAVs and drones and, and, and reconnaissance aircraft and spy and spies physically on the ground, human, your human intelligence that's being fed to you. We have such a diversity of information that's being fed in at any given time that the commanders were physically incapable of processing it all in, so they said, that they could not process all the information in. So we needed to turn, even back in the United States military back in 2006, we got to experiment with some of these little think pads that had artificially intelligent battlefield commanders on them that made these decisions for you and yeah. gave you your orders. They weren't humans, but they acted like a human and they persuaded you to think they were like Cortana or any other version of this today. Yeah. They have persuaded you to be able to think that you're still talking to a human being when the human being left the scene 20 years ago. And all you're really contending against is this Skynet. It's the same system that they put forth for generations, but it they took the human agents out of it and they have created proxy wars through bots. They are literally fighting their bot armies. The United States Air Force is putting out publicly that, yeah, we're going to have all these drone aircraft fighting alongside our fighter pilots. You know, all those pretty cool, good looking Top Gun guys. We promise that you can be a be all you can be in the United States Army. But, you know, all you're really going to become is another drone. That's ultimately what the goal is. The goal is that this technocracy, these individuals who want to hold the power, they only wanted us around as long as was necessary to create the system so that they could have the robotic slaves to be able to govern the society and manage the system. We needed their forest keepers. They needed somebody to go out there and, and you know, occasionally put out the forest fires and deal with all of the riffraff that's happened. But now that they can create that artificial intelligent army, all, all these these drones – they don't need us. And what you're going to see is a systemic slaughtering off of humankind as that is put forth. Like even I went down to the, the Georgia Guidestones back in uh, 2018, 2019. Yeah. I went down to the Georgia Guidestones at a conference that I went to called the Sacred Word Conference. I, sp I gave a talk called Our Duty in the End Times. And at that talk, we went there and we, we looked at those stones and examined for ourselves. These are the, the, ten, the Decalogue stone for their, for their way of saying it. It's their Ten Commandments of the New World Order. And the yes. preeminent preeminent yes. pros of it was to reduce the population down to half a billion people. That's They're right. like, well, how are you going to get down there? Well, you got to slaughter off billions of human beings. Well, how do you do that? Well, you've got quite a few different options. If you're one of the players at hand, you've got a biological option. You've got wars. Those are very effective, right? And when there's nothing that drives humankind to uh, change their perspectives faster than war. You know, you get, there's no feminists that exist during a war torn country. I'll tell you that much. Everything goes hell in a handbasket so fast when people realize that men got to go slaughter and be slaughtered by each other. And there's all those people that demanding equal rights that suddenly don't want to volunteer for that task because they have no idea what is required to be a frontline combat engineer. You have no idea what's required of you to have the blood and the brains of your brothers and your sisters that you love to be to be dripping all over you in the stench of filth, defiling you on a continual basis. Nobody wants that. But once you're in it, man, there's no other place on the face of the earth to experience what it's like to suffer immeasurably so. And my desire is not that we end up there, but I know it's an inevitability that this is going to turn to bloodshed and violence. However, we got to be very, very careful that we're not the ones to pull the trigger first. As much as they might want to put it upon anybody, you have to be careful that these are the tools that you use as long as possible. But then to understand that the way that we can turn back to that is to set ourselves free like this. 
You want to talk about a book that literally saved lives? Right here. This one. It's called Home Birth on Your Own Terms by Heather Baker. Because of this book, I have two twin babies in the next room that are alive, and my wife is also alive. You know what? We gave birth to those babies in a house, an Airbnb. Because if we went and checked into a hospital, they would have cut my wife into pieces through cesarean sections because yeah. that's basically the protocol these days is that they induce babies. My wife did not know that she had twins, by the way. We never went to an ultrasound. We never went to a midwife. We never went down any of that stuff because we believe that Yahuwah made the body perfect and that its original design was that women gave birth on their own. They could have midwives there or you could have your husband there, which is an amazing way to be. Man, this was your place right there. Be next to your wife. It's a beautiful place to be. I got to catch both of my children, including my son, who I thought was a placenta until he shot out and I caught him in a copper basin. But because of this book, we were armed with information like, hey, what do I do when there's major bleeding happening? Wow, there's these medicines called herbs that you could give to be able to stop the bleeding and cause uterine contractions. Changed our life completely. We, gave a, we did a video on it about our birth story. It's the deliverance has come. Uh, our birth story. You can see that. I'll put that link in the show notes when I get a chance. But this book armed us with the information that was absolutely necessary. One book changed my family's life instantly. Because we had this after three nights of labor, she gave birth successfully to twins at home. This is a way that you can stay out of that corporate controlled doctors of Hermes that are trying to just ruin everyone. That was a book that changed our life forever. Foraging. This is one that we're super passionate about is that you can learn how to find food all around you. You don't have to be slaves to the system where they tell you you've got to put this genetic language experience, genetic modification program in your body. If you want to come eat here, you can learn how to find food for yourself and learn the skills of what it takes to be OK. Like my daughter, Naomi, is competent. She can walk outside and find snacks. Because I took her to those farms, she learned that food grew outside and it didn't come from the store. She used to walk around on that farm, that Danny's farm down there, and she used to eat tangerines from under the trees till she was almost sick of it. It was amazing. And because of that, she knows she can walk outside and eat clovers whenever she wants. She knows that she can eat dandelions and she can eat certain things. And she also knows when the neighbor goes and sprays glyphosate and Monsatan's poison on everything, nice. not to eat that stuff, not to even walk on it, right? Yeah. Like these are, these are basic things that can really do an incredible work on your life. And- this is what we're so oh one more just one more real quick i know i'm like no no this is awesome please but there was one more book i really wanted to um this one y'all this one got me fired up like crazy so we put together we were, we were going to a fellowship at the time and we put together something called the arm armory and we just took all these books because i'm a fiend for books y'all and i have a lot and a lot of them and i lived in an rv so i couldn't keep them and i had just like hundreds of I had dozens of totes of these books and so i began to give them away to people and i put them in a library system well somebody left this little treasure in there and i was like trees in missouri that's great i currently live in missouri and i love the ozark area but i've been traveling we did 150,000 miles traveling around this country and i got obsessed with trees and this book was just blew my mind because it would have these nice little pictographs, right? You're like, oh, yeah, that's so nice. It's like detailed illustrations. And then it would talk about a few different things about its appearance. And then it had this really beautiful little section in here which said medicinal uses. I was like, medicinal uses? This is fantastic. It's super illegal to put this in most books these days, right? They're like, don't you go tell people that trees are medicine. Don't you dare. You tell them it comes from the pharmaceutical aisle. Like, this is just so beautiful. Check this out. So, so in, in this book, he just goes through what are the native trees. He's not even talking about other ones that are in here. But like oak, let's just go to the oaks. When in doubt, y'all, go to the oaks. If you want medicine, go to the oaks. Like with everything. I can't even tell you. The oaks are just one of the most consistently medicinal trees that have ever been. Okay? As in with all other oaks, the bark especially has astringent. It causes tissues to contract. Native Americans use inner bark tea to treat diarrhea mouth sores, chapped skin, asthma, and coughs. Basically, when you got a problem in your body, y'all, go scrape the inner bark of an oak tree into a pile of boiling water and drink it. It will blow your mind how much better you feel. If you can't poop, y'all, it's because your body needs help. Your body needs help. You don't have enough insoluble fiber in your body, which is why we fresh mill our own flour. It changed our life completely. But just this single book began to make me go look around at all that green stuff growing outside. Instead of just seeing like a haze of green, I began to be able to clearly identify stuff because it had usefulness to me. It had a usefulness to me. And when we see the, the world around us as useful as instead of this burden of society, like why is it that there's not places where there's fruit trees growing everywhere? Our society used to, to cultivate life. Instead, we are bonded to death 
we are convinced that the only thing we can do is just slowly, incrementally work our way towards some dreamland called retirement, some dreamland where I get to cash out this 401k that they promised me would be my deliverance, that I can collect my social security. I can go back to the golf course and I can walk around till my arthritic hip goes out and I die a miserable death in a nursing home. How embarrassingly despairing of a doctrine have we inherited? This yeah. is the doctrines of demons, y'all. But you can get set free with a simple walk in the park, y'all. And you can pick some leaves and throw them in a pot of water like the mulberry leaf. You can throw a pot of mulberry leaves. It cures diabetes. I know that's a super controversial statement. But it's actually backed by humans that did something called scientific research in hundreds of countries try or in hundreds of different studies trying to identify how can we use these things to save our population? Because not everywhere is everyone so hell-bent on murdering their populace. There's still places in the earth, like over in Russia, where they are a terrorist if you plant genetically engineered crops in the ground. That's a beautiful sentence. If you're somebody who's like Monsatan and is trying to engineer a society in your image. But if you instead allow people to plant life-giving plants and seeds in the ground, it changes people instantly. That's absolutely fantastic. And I guess uh, I, it goes without saying that your kids are not going to get vaccinated. You know, it's a pretty strong statement, David, but you're most certainly right. The, the, the thing that I, a true vaccine for my family is the inoculant of truth. And as long as I continue to give that to them, it gives them the opportunity to make sound decisions for themselves, right? Because the, the truth is, as much as I want to insulate them, I had a real strong desire to insulate them from the world. My family was so systemically evil for so long in my life that I knew that radical intelligent evil puts on skin suits and was going to crawl its way and eventually try to kick down their doors, try to devour them sooner or later, and mostly through here, through our eye gates and our, through our ear gates. That sooner or later, they were going to try to get their dirty tendrils all over my children's minds, right? And I was like, the corporate, like, it, you can't keep your children out of the system. You really can't. You have to find ways to help them to navigate it successfully because they're sooner or later going to make their own decisions without you being over there to help knock the hands of creepers off of their bodies. You're going to have to teach them how to make these decisions to the best of their ability. Like one of the guys, I started hanging out with families of, that had large families, like children more than five like families who had 10 children. And like one of the guys, Patrick Rohrman, he has a mtknives.com. He's a knife maker now, but he has 10 children, okay? And I was like, I want to get to know this guy because he's a successful human and a dad, and I don't even know how to do that. So I need help. I need to learn that. Well, he was a lineman. You know, he climbed a telephone poles. He fixed electrical equipment. He worked on the biggest machine in the face of the world, which is the United States electrical grid. He kept that up and running. He learned a trade to be able to support his family where he could make enough money to support what their family's needs were. Well, he always had a passion about making knives. So he went and learned a trade from one of the best guys out there who was making knives at the time. And he began to make knives, right? And sell them. And like, this is one little knife that I got to help make in his in his uh, shop in Missouri. I went and lived with him for three weeks so I could do an internship with him to learn how to make this. This was his little talent knife, right? And this is from a steel called CTSXHP, an incredibly awesome tool steel, that, or a carpenter tool steel, that I got to learn how to make this a tool from a piece of sheet metal that was basically worthless until we turned it into something marvelous. And he is someone who has converted this knowledge bank into something practical that adds value to his people around him and people pay him for that skill. That's a, that's somebody who has learned how to cut their way out of the system. And he's able to raise his children outside of that. Like his son made this little bat for me out of Osage orange, which is one of the most incredible plants on the face of the earth. They're one of the hardest woods on the earth. His son, when we went to a thrift store, found an old, uh, Oh, what was it? Able to carve this wood off of there. Um, and, he was able to use this to, to carve this for me. And he carves out spoons and buttons and all kinds of things. He's 12 years old and he's making all kinds of tools and he's selling them. And he's giving them the opportunity to know the skills they can make their own way through this world and add value to each other. And when we keep our children out of that system long enough to give them the armory that they need to navigate that system, they can take a piece of chunk of wood and turn it into a livelihood. They can take a piece of metal and turn it into a tool that will feed families for generations to come. My hope is that by sharing this information with you, that you will use these tools to be effective at waging your own war. Each of you can reach a sphere of influence that I cannot reach, and you can go and set those captives of cowardice free by equipping them with the knowledge and the information that they need to be emboldened to go forward and be the bold and courageous lions that we were made to be, to devour con this conspiracy of silence everywhere we find it. 
This has been an outstanding hour, and uh, I just I, I can't thank you enough for being with us. We look forward to having you on again. I know that you're uh, uh, Penny setting it up with you, so you can be on a regular basis. And this has been great. We've learned a, a, a tremendous amount. Um, so I just want to thank you, Nathan, for coming on the program today. We'll talk to you again real soon. Uh, how can people get in contact with you? Yeah, people can reach me at snatched from the flames at protonmail.com. They can go to youtube.com backslash Nathan Reynolds. I have a whole YouTube channel with a couple hundred videos on there or snatched from the flames.com where a lot of our work is also available. So I look forward to seeing you, Penny and David again. I thank you all for taking the time to be here. May you all live dangerously out there. We will. Thank you so much. May God bless you, sir. Nathan Reynolds here on the Awake Nation. Again, snatched from the flames.com and snatched from the flames at protonmail.com, I think is yes. what he said. We're going to take a quick break. Well, that was a great hour. God. It was chock full of information. Oh, my God. We just have some of the best guests on the planet. And come-